everyone, and welcome to episode 137 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, here we are at the end of another year, and what a year it has been. I think most of us are probably a little tired of listening to the real news from 2021, so here is a look back at all the best parts of the past year, the medieval stuff. Here again for the third annual Medieval Podcast Year in Review is Peter Kinechny from Medievalist.net to help take us through what happened over the past year in the world of medieval studies and medieval fandom. Here's our conversation about everything from new discoveries to movies to video games to our own adventures in 2021. Well, Peter, welcome back. It is time to talk about 2021, another epic year, another year for the history books. Take it from Mm -hmm. two historians. Oh, you know, I was just thinking it's still 2020. (laughs) It feels like that. It feels like that. When I think of 2022, it still seems like the distant future. You know, something you'd see in a sci-fi novel, but here we are, Indeed. we're staring Indeed. it in the face. <laughs> yeah, it's just just approaching us. So so you are the person who does the roundup of the news for Medievalist.net. When I appear on Medievalist.net, it's always to write, you know, little pieces, five-minute Medievalist pieces, but you are the news guy. So what were some of the things that happened in the news this year, as far yeah. as Medieval Studies goes? Yeah, Medieval Studies, all it still churns along uh and unsurprisingly most uh most important news i think deals with plagues plagues <laughs> yeah tell us about it the biggest uh kind of news piece came out in january and it's an article by hannah barker in speculum and it's where she basically destroys the old tale of how the black death spreads into europe every history book says that the Mongols were besieging this place called Kaffa on the North Sea. They tossed in dead bodies, plague-ridden bodies into the city, and the city got all infected, and then Italian merchants kind of were fleeing the city, and they carried it off back to Italy. So that was the kind of old story. And I think people have been chipping away at that one for a few times, but literally uh, she comes off with, this is exactly how it happened, which was actually awful in the Black Sea, but actually it dealt with trade. Fleets of Italian ships going there to get grain. Go back to, you know, Florence and Venice and, and Genoa and get, like, uh, supply to cities because they're having, you know, bad harvests, things like that. So their international trade, that's how it uh, spreads. And, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be something that, like, any kind of mainstream history book is going to have to throw out that section and put in Hannah Berker's research. So, yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. <laughs> That was pretty good. It's game changing. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So also there's a, a nice debate going on about the Justiniac plague or, or the plague of Justinian as it's better known. So early this year, there was an article in American Historical Review. It's by uh, Merle Eisenberg and Lee Mordecai. And basically they're kind of just saying that that event is exaggerated, right? It did have such a big impact on the Mediterranean region or the medieval world. And now, just last month, Peter Saris in Past and Present, he says, you know, we shouldn't really downplay the significance of the plague. And he's fighting against uh, that other article. And these are two of the bigger journals for historians. So, yeah, so a nice little debate. It seems a healthy debate. They weren't name-calling each other. or I don't think they're mad at each other, but, like, I think people will want to, you know, kind of look at both articles and kind of see, you know, where that area is. And I'm sure it's not the end of the discussion either. Oh, no, absolutely not. I mean, we need these discussions. We need people to go from one direction to the other and and argue this stuff out until we can figure out where the middle ground is or who has the idea that makes the most sense. I mean, history is never static, right? Yeah, I think debate. And challenging ideas is a really good thing. I think that's how historians can get their minds around things and be able to question and things like that, right? So I think that's kind of like some of the important, very important news that I think that I came across, at least when it comes to plagues. (laughs) It's important to think about plagues now. Well, I mean, plague studies, some of the most interesting work that's being done now, and it's one of the places where you see interdisciplinarity. So like people who are working in the science, people who are working in the humanities, all working together to figure out how these plagues affected people. And I mean, of course, we are very invested in looking at how that turned out, both at the first plague pandemic or the Justinian plague, Justiniac plague, yeah. and also the second plague pandemic, which is the Black Death that we 
think about more often perhaps when we think about plagues. So yeah, plague studies, wow, it's a good place to start digging in and learning more stuff because the people working in plague studies are a model for how I think history should be going moving forward at all this working together with across disciplines. Yeah, yeah, definitely making use of archaeological, medical, uh, all that kind of, you know, genetics, right? It's, you mm-hmm. learn so much, right? Yeah, I think it's been a really kind of fascinating field. And people are thinking about it these days, obviously. So it makes for some good news. <laughs> The good news about the bad news. I I live in the Middle Ages, literally. (laughs) Well, plague times again. So those are some of the things that you found most interesting that are happening in medieval studies these days. Yeah. Yeah, that was, I, was, I would say my number one, my kind of number two area deals with the Norse in North America. I guess the big news was research done about wooden fragments found at Lanso Meadows. Mm-hmm. They weren't like created naturally. Someone had to cut them up and they were able to kind of figure exactly when they were felled, which is the year 1021. So that means Lanso Meadows, this time it was settled was 1021, which is roughly corresponding with the sagas and how they kind of relate. Like around that time, that's when they, you know, were coming to Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, things like that. So that that was kind of really kind of interesting. Again, really kind of uh, nice interdisciplinary research. So there's that. There's also the news that Italians knew about North America in the 14th century. So news of that region was reported in like a chronicle from the mid 14th century in Italy. There's a place called Marcolata, probably Markland, which is Labrador. There was a place there called Marcolata with big trees and, you know, weird things. We don't know too much about it, but uh, <laughs> it's this Italian uh, historian. So I kind of found that really kind of neat, the idea, like, you know, the bit of information passing along. Yeah, that's a story I hadn't actually come across. I hadn't read about that. So thanks for bringing that to my attention because that's, that's interesting news. I mean, <laughs> it's a few hundred years old, but it's interesting news yeah. to me. And, you know, the kind of final bit with dealing with the, the Norse is Vinland, the Vinland map. Like it's finally, finally determined it's a fake. They've been doing a slew of tests over the last few decades, right? And it's kind of been going back and forth on like, is it real? Is it made in the 20th century? And yeah, the ink from it all is all 20th century. And <laughs> alas. Another myth put to bed. Yeah. Another bit of forgery that some guy did. It's probably <laughs> to sell sell a manuscript at a little higher price. Yeah, but that kind of stuff is really interesting, I think. And again, it's because of the interdisciplinarity. We have the scientists now who have such good techniques to figure this stuff out. And uh, you can actually put things like this myth to bed and no one has to spill any more ink about it anymore. Yeah, I think actually one of the really good areas of research is looking at manuscripts scientifically, being able to test them. And I listened to a paper earlier this year talking about how they figured out which seals these various French manuscripts were being made from, like what type of a seal, right? So some from Norway and some from Greenland and really kind of fascinating stuff. Did we do well by going into like reading historical documents? We should be scientists. That's how. (laughs) I mean, yeah, it's super fun to read the literature, but I mean, (laughs) the archaeologists and the scientists, they they get the movies like Indiana Jones, right? (laughs) Or the movies about the Sutton Who burials and things like that. We don't get movies made about us because we are reading the sources. You got to dig and get dirty. Maybe that's the payoff that they get, right? The compensation. They have all Mm -hmm. these dirty field garments and maybe their laundry bills are offset by the fact that their field looks a lot sexier than ours. That's right. Yeah, they get the they get the fame. You know, one of my uh, other news bits, like there's a, a mass grave of soldiers from a 1491 siege that was discovered, like 30, thir- over 30 of them. So mm-hmm. yeah, all sorts of little interesting discoveries. A thousand-year-old egg. A thousand-year-old egg? I haven't heard yeah. this one. Oh, yeah. It was discovered in Israel, and there was a little bit of yolk left in it. Nearly intact egg. And there was enough, like, of the yolk in there that they actually going to be able to make some research like to take samples and you know <laughs> so. you're gonna say make some omelets or something <laughs> yeah. 
don't what eat it. Do with this? Oh, I had to had to eat it raw that egg. <laughs> it's like you hear these stories about people finding two thousand year old honey or something in Egyptian yeah. tombs or other tombs, and uh, they say it's still edible. Like, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. Don't eat it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I'd give it a try. Yeah, so like all sorts of little fun little discoveries. The scuba diver found a crusader sword. That mm -hmm. was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah, know, things like that. My funnest article was how those late medieval shoes, those long shoes that, you know, that you see in like manuscripts and stuff like that, they cost people bunions. Of course they did. Of course yeah. they did. <laughs> They're so. so narrow and pointy. They also caused people to go to hell, actually, if you believe the preachers of the time, too. Well, especially if you're going to wear them, like, yeah, you already have that pain, so why not? <laughs> it's so. practice for the pains of hell you'll feel yeah. later on for wearing pointy shoes. Yeah. I love those things, though. They're so cool. Oh, indeed. They're, 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 they're so medieval, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Those are kind of my news stories for, like, 2021. On a little more dour note, sour note, this was a lot of important medievalists passed away this year. Mm -hmm. um i was able to kind of make a list i'll give you some of the names and if i'm leaving anyone out i'm really sorry i think there's probably plenty of others but Derek pearsall Derek yeah. keen giles constable uh sharon k penman michael clanchy noel swerdlow jonathan fricaro susan reynolds i remember reading her works quite a bit cyril mango byzantinist colin morris David Lacombe, the Dante scholar. This is a lot of historians, a lot of pretty important voices and researchers in medieval studies field, unfortunately passed away this year. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of sad. Like with all of these, I have read their works and like, well, this has been an important person in my, you know, research. I, Derek Keane, for me, you know, was one of the most important scholars of London, medieval London's history. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the lucky thing about having such a small field is that these people will be remembered because we are familiar with their work. This is work that we come across and that people have built on for years. So the good thing about our field being small is that these people will be remembered. There are definitely names that I knew of, even though I didn't know any of these people personally, but they will be remembered. Yeah, and, and their research will be remembered too. So uh, I, I'm really glad to have you know read and learned at a distance from them with them and i'm sad to see them go and uh yeah mm -hmm. they've left a lot of good research for us to build on from here a, a good so. a good legacy so yeah absolutely absolutely so it's worth taking a moment to say that we will remember these giants of our field and we'll keep reading them in the future which is i think all you can ask as a scholar that your research keeps going on into the future which is which is brilliant and which is, again, one of the most beautiful things about our field, I think. Exactly, exactly. Well, in other news, there there have been a few developments in pop culture this year. This is, you ever notice that there are some years where there are just a bunch of medieval movies? <laughs> like, yeah, oh yeah. Some years you have like three medieval movies or two. Or, that seems like a lot when you're considering, again, the size of our field. But this year there were Three significant ones, I think. There are also ones that are not done in English, but the big ones that came out this year, of course, are mm. The Green Knight, which we saw in the summertime, which is a great movie. Indeed. Oh, yeah. I, I remember watching that with you at the Toronto Theatre, and that was really excellent. So, Yeah, it was the first time going to the theatre in a long time <laughs> yeah, for me, anyway. <laughs> that was a good time. And it was an interesting movie, I thought, because rarely – do people look at the Middle Ages in this kind of art film type way? So it was, it was cool to see that. I thought that was good. And of course, it was a great performance by Dave Patel. So that was great. Yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. I think that might be the film that will have the most influence Yeah. over the next like generation or so. And people in medieval studies might be talking about that film more than anything. Oh, for sure. Next year is Kalamazoo. <laughs> All the Kalamazoo's to come, there's going to be a lot of papers about it. Lots of classes, people are going to be watching it. And I think it's worthwhile. There's a lot to really get into in that film, both visually and in storytelling. And 
yeah, performance and how it relates back to the poem and all of these things. So it's a very rich film. I think it's just come out on the streaming platforms and we'll see how the rest of the public reacts to it. But I think that medieval studies and the medieval nerds have really accepted and embraced it. And like you say, I think it's going to be one that we hear about for a long time. Indeed, indeed. And uh, we've got to try the Green Knight game. Yeah, <laughs> yes. The board game that they came out with it. So. <laughs> yeah, we haven't sat down with that yet. The Green Knight role-playing game. It's got a beautiful die, I think I mentioned when, when we oh, talked yeah, yeah. about the movie. It's really pretty, <laughs> but we <laughs> haven't played it yet. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the other blockbuster, it didn't have a a fantastic showing at the box office, and that's The Last Duel. And mm -hmm. we talked about it a lot, so we're not going to talk about it too much now, but that was the other one that came out. And I think that in our field, it's been somewhat controversial, and, and we talked about this a little bit in the episode that we did. Mm -hmm. Everyone's comments have been really fair-minded about it, I think. But uh, what I think is really interesting and cool about this movie coming out is that people are still willing to put money into big blockbusters about medieval stuff. I mean, it still has to be mud and blood, which is what we yeah. talked about too when we reviewed it, but people are still investing in that. So there have been some speculations made in the media that perhaps this is the last big medieval epic, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think people are going to be still making these for years to come. Yeah, I think A, I've heard that with a other, bunch of other films, Right, you know, yeah. that didn't uh, do so well at the box office. And look, uh, I think, you know, Ridley Scott and the kind of big name actors, they were really interested. They thought there was a good tale to tell. And there are a lot of other good medieval tales to tell. And I think it'll just inspire people. Like, so I know Ridley Scott, you know, if you can read, like he's kind of a bit disappointed, didn't do yeah. as well in box office. But I actually think it was going to do a lot better in streaming. We'll have to see yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think he left enough time for that before he made his remarks. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> everyone is entitled to their own opinion. And the other movie that we talked about on the podcast that I think is worth mentioning here at the end of the year is Steel Song, which is the one by uh, Adrian Cicerone. And it was featuring the women who do medieval armored combat. And uh, I thought that was just a really beautiful little documentary i say little because it wasn't very long it was really well done so people who haven't seen that can see that on streaming platforms now because when we did the episode it was just before it came out so in case you wanted to see it and you've forgotten about it this is your chance to go back and see steel song it's it's worthwhile we were talking a few weeks ago about the uh the streaming that i did for twitch i was talking to some of the other people who are doing medieval armored combat and they really like that film too so steel song is that documentary about medieval armored combat and the women who are doing it and it's a it's a worthwhile movie to mention i think here at the yeah, end of I 2021 think it, uh, yeah i think it was really great and uh, it was a great topic to kind of handle and uh yeah documentaries are, are a really good way of reaching out to the wider public too so uh if they're done well yeah it can bring lots of people interested into the medieval world. Yeah, and I thought this was a good one. As I mentioned, I think when I was speaking with Adrian about it, in that it really shows the ways that women are welcomed into this community too, because I think if you're watching movies about the Middle Ages and stuff, you, you see all these dudes that they're always fighting and stuff like that. But these women in armored combat are also enjoying it very much and they're also welcomed into the the community. So it's something that women can be involved in, in a physical way. And uh, that's something you don't see very often, which is why I, another reason why I quite like that documentary. Peter's like, yep, yep, yeah. it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the other things that came out in pop culture, maybe you have an opinion on this one, Peter. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Wheel of Time, of course, came out. Now, I am a person who never read any of those books. The Wheel of Time series. But I started watching the the show, as I think many of us have. So Wheel of Time is based on a series of books, and it's just come out. I think Amazon Prime is the only one that's showing it right now. But yeah. this time, it's it's the women that have got the magic and the, the men yeah, who are I, living in their world. Yeah, indeed. This is Robert Jordan's uh, series. And the set of books that I've been seeing, you see forever on bookshelves and in used bookstores. 
there's a big fandom for it. Again, I'm like you in like episode three, episode four right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've been enjoying it. I think, you know, it's uh, uh, a good little fantasy tale. It reminds me of others. It kind of has that classic. Uh, we're at the point where they're on this, they're heading to one place, right? So, <laughs> so on this, you know. Pursued by yeah. an army. <laughs> Pers- yeah, pursued by the bad guys. We don't know why. Lots of little mystery. Uh, not having read the books, there's like some challenges to know like, who is the main character here? Who's who's the center around, right? Because we have mm-hmm. a few options. So mm-hmm. Usually I read the books first. Like I pretty much always read the books first. I'm just one of these people that I need to read it first. But mm-hmm. this time I didn't. I just jumped right into the TV series. And so this is kind of a cool experience for me because I get to, as you say, figure things out as I go and, and enjoy the world without any preconceived notions of it that I've built in my own imagination. So yeah, it's cool. And I think this also speaks to the fact that there is a constant interest in the Middle Ages because, you know, if you have Amazon putting all this money into a whole long series, a big series, (laughs) and it's got a big budget because of, you know, the makeup, special effects and all that, Mm -hmm. it really speaks to that appetite that people have for the Middle Ages. So it's great to see Wheel of Time coming out. Yeah, like I think it's it's something of a bit of a prelude to the huge Tolkien series that's going to come, uh, I think, next year. Or so I think so, yeah. The big grand telling, like Cimmerillion and other kind of Tolkien Middle Earth books, so fantasy literature, and that's another again another way to get people like interested in the past. If you're a medievalist, yeah, you love that kind of stuff too. <laughs> I mean, you know, how could you resist it? It's like catnip, right? You have to see what people are doing with this time period and how they're exploring it. And yeah. especially nowadays, there's so many different ways to explore it that, well, one of the things that's cool about fantasy is you can experiment with society and societal values and see how that yeah. works out in this space of uh, fantasy. So I think it's great. I think it's great. And that reminds me, speaking of experiments and medievalism and all that stuff, something I've only just found out is that DC Comics has just come out with a whole new series with all of your favorite characters reimagined into the medieval world. And the series is called Dark Knights of Steel. And it came out this fall, so it's got two comic books out so far. And the premise is, well, I mean, it's a total reimagining. So you have to be invested in this idea that there's, you know, an alternate universe of DC characters. So what's happened is uh, Superman's ship has arrived in the Middle Ages instead of in the 1930s uh, or 40s. Sorry. Sorry, Superman fans. It's either the 30s or 40s that he arrives. <laughs> I should know this. I love Superman. So instead, Superman arrives in the Middle Ages. And you know from the first comic book that things are completely different. But it's cool to see these superheroes in their medieval armor mashups. It's totally imaginative. And it's not something that I would ever think that scholars should look at and say, you know, this is not right. This armor is not right. I mean, you do have Batman having bat ears on his helmet so it's not supposed to be realistic but for people who are fans of comic books and medievalism dark knights of steel is a new thing to check out which shows yeah how I'm, cool I'm, the middle ages still are i'm definitely gonna check it out yeah yeah it's interesting there's so many forms of video games there's always new things coming out uh, I, w- I wish i covered it more on medieval stuff man I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how i can do that unfortunately you have to play these games quite a bit so. <laughs> well, if you are a gamer and you want to do this as a beat on Medievalist.net, I mean, why don't they reach out to you, right? Medievalist.net. Oh, yeah, do, do reach out. Medievalist.net at gmail.com. <laughs> Indeed, but, you know, you, you had your taste of video games this right. year. So. Yes. So I heard that Chivalry 2 is out, but I, I don't know anything about that. But I do know about Age of Empires 4. And that's just come out. It came out at the end of October. And Age of Empires 4, it's got all the stuff that people like about Age of Empires, where you have all of these different civilizations or empires, as they call them. And you get to play them, and they get to beat up each other and stuff. And you get to see if you can conquer the world. But it's very complicated in a good way, in that they've really put in the research about it. And again, You can put in all the research you want. You still have to make choices, narrative choices that scholars might like and might not like. You can't please everybody. But they've put in so much effort to making this as historically correct as they can. And they've gone so far as to have 
little vignettes, so they'll have little videos in the middle of the game that talk to historians and show you how technology works. There's even one that talks about Henry getting the arrow in the face, which is something I talked about with <laughs> Alana Krug back in the day on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So little videos like that throughout the game that you can get to and watch. It's really cool. They put in a lot of effort. So yeah, Age of Empires 4 deals with everything from 1066 to the early 17th century. And it deals with everybody from England all the way to China and south to the Delhi Sultanate. So lots of good stuff and good gameplay in that. It looks like a lot of fun. In my younger days, I loved that kind of one kingdom against another, one country versus another, seeing how it all plays out. Yeah, and what you're getting at, I think, a second ago is that I don't play video games very much or very long because I'm not very good at them. <laughs> let's be real. Let's be real. As long as I don't appreciate them. I've played the classics, you know, World of Warcraft and uh, Lord of the Rings and Age of Empires, but I don't play them a lot because I'm not great at them. But I was really interested and privileged to be part of simulation mode which we were talking about a second ago and i mentioned on the podcast which was a, a live stream on twitch where we made age of empires 4 come alive with medieval combat and i got to do color commentary so that was super cool that was something i did this year that was super fun so i was really impressed with age of empires 4 especially getting the chance to like step in and make it come alive for people on twitch the game I, I kind of only play that is medieval related is Minecraft, right? And <laughs> yeah, I, I do that, you know, a little bit. And and this this year actually, um, someone made a game where you have Bodium Castle. Basically, my job to go and clear it out of all its monsters. Oh, I I spent a good I'd say fifty hours on that. Did you really? <laughs> I did. I did. Like. See, you must be more talented at it than I am. <laughs> I, I, got, I got killed probably 150 <laughs> times, but uh, but you, you you learn how to tunnel your way under these monsters and then attack them from below. So I was I wasn't very chivalrous, I have to say, but uh, I, <laughs> I eventually got the job done and claimed that castle as my own. So. Oh, there you go, there you go. You've accomplished something great during probably during lockdown. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So what else have you been up to this year? As I think a lot of your listeners will know, I'm also the editor of Medieval Warfare magazine. So I think I had another really good year. This is, I've now over five years being editor, and I think it's a, a pretty good run. And I'm really proud of all the writers. We did an issue on Holy War, on the importance of military technology. And like, you know, the one I think I'll, I'll say the most I'm really proud of is the one where I got to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. on uh, Le Juvencel, right? And mm -hmm. uh, as editor, I get to choose <laughs> who writes and stuff like that. And I really wanted you to write for that. And you wrote one half, I wrote the other half of two articles talking about that. I didn't think it's a really important text. So for anyone that's interested in medieval military history, so I wanted to feature that. And I'm really, really glad that I got you to write. Oh, thank you. Well, for the people who didn't listen to your favorite books of last year episode on the podcast. <laughs> Givencel, Le Givencel is a story about military tactics, but it's basically told as a romance. So that was a really fun book to read and to work on for Medieval Warfare. So that was good. And I really think people should pick up that edition of Medieval Warfare magazine, check out Le Givencel, and also get the book because it's a good book. Although that translation is a bit, a bit pricey. <laughs> It so, is, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, on that end, Medieval Warfare, I'm, I'm really proud. And then with Medievalist.net, it's been a huge year of growth. All the kind of columnists now that we have, uh, besides the Medieval podcast, we've got like four other podcasts under our umbrella now. So uh, that is keeping me very busy. And yeah, I'm just loving everyone that's interested in Medievalist.net and the support we're getting. Yes. Well, two of those podcasts just came out this year, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we've got the Medieval Grad Podcast with Lucy Lemonnier. And uh, that's more of a very geared for people that uh, graduate students, people really in medieval studies talking about cutting edge research. I think that's doing a, a really good service. And then Bow and Blade with Kelly DeVries and Michael Livingston. They're, uh, they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, talking about battles and sieges and 
we can put a microphone at whether two are just chatting for like a couple hours and then we get to hear all the little bits about war. Yeah, so. that's what I was thinking. It was always fun to get together with Michael and Kelly at a conference and have dinner and listen to them talk. And now everybody gets to do that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really proud of the podcasts. I think that's been a really good way of reaching out. You'd be happy to know that you're you're circling like the top 100 podcasts in history, yay! In the world, yay! So I just got into like this website that has like the stats, so like, like official, you know. So these are official numbers, right? Oh, so. I didn't know that. That's very exciting. Well, this year we reached 100 episodes. 100 episodes and if you haven't listened to that extended podcast our 100th episode you should because it's just so much fun and i know that like people say nice things about me and it so i mean there's that for me to like about it but what's cool about it is you get to hear all the collegiality of it like everyone in our field really loves being in our field. And so to hear that 100th episode, you get that enthusiasm from some of your favorite people who have been on the podcast. So 100 episodes is a big deal. And I was so excited about it and so happy with that one episode because it's so great to have a reunion of all, all these wonderful people. And then the other big thing that happened on this podcast was we passed 1 million downloads, which is yeah. amazing, amazing. It felt great. It felt just fabulous because getting to talk about this stuff every week is just a dream come true. So I'm just so happy that everyone has been with us on the journey. I'm really, really, as I said before, I, I'm really proud of all the great work you can put into this, all the hard work you put into this, to, you know, create this. We're just talking about like how it's just even like the last month and a half, we've seen another kind of spike in growth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really impressive. So people, people are coming in all the time and they're listening to every episode, like, all the episodes are getting plans, right? Like episode one, episode 27, there's always seems to be new listeners every day, which is really great. Basically, you're going to make people like listen for like 300 hours. <laughs> well, it's not all me. It's not all me. I'm interviewing some of the coolest, most brilliant people in the field. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's a joy for me. And I just want to give a shout out to all the people who send me messages and say that this podcast has helped you through the pandemic or helped you, you know, on long car trips and truck mm -hmm. trips or helped you fall asleep. I'm so happy to be part of that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it's helping you fall asleep in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the other things that happened this year is everybody who's anybody has put out a new book. There's so many new books out this year and it's so exciting. It's so exciting to see like all these wonderful historians have put books out and I know that some of them have put books out and I hadn't haven't got to them on the podcast. So I should probably say that I'm getting to a bunch of those exciting books in the coming months. So if I haven't talked about your favorite book yet, it's probably coming up because there's yeah. lots more to come on the podcast. Coming oh yeah, it's so hard to just keep track of all the publication going on and all the books and collected essays, all that kind of stuff, just the amount of stuff it, it, it is mind boggling. You come across these wonderful small works here and there that like, oh yeah, gosh, you're, you're doing this little topic. It's so gratifying to see that and to have them come on to you know, the medieval podcast and talk about it really helps put a face to like some of their these historians or a voice writers. anyway <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well what i love about it and i'm not just talking about the podcast but i think we have a good variety on the podcast what i love about the publications that have come out this year is there's something for everybody so I've talked to a lot of authors this year, you know, there's stuff about like romance and chivalry and big sweeping histories and like Vikings and just pretty much if you like it, <laughs> there's a new book about it this year in 2021. So that's super exciting, I think. Yeah, it can have wonderful ways of accessing research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think more people are able to reach more people. <laughs> <laughs> how, do I, how do I want to put that? More people are being able to access it is what I'm trying to say through Kindle. Like a lot of people are able to access medieval studies through e-readers, which is amazing. And through audiobooks, people accessing medieval studies in alternative formats other than just a book. And I think, I mean, a paper book. And I think that is something that has really pushed our field ahead too in a brilliant way. And another thing is also the more involvement in open access. 
Mm-hmm. A lot of publishers now have that option. So we're seeing lots of great research just coming out where these books are available for free. Like you can just download or you could buy the print copy. I kind of around Christmas time, I do do a post of like new open access books. So I'll look for that on medievalist.net. Yeah, I'm, I'm, cool. collecting, I'm collecting a list as we speak, so saving, <laughs> saving them. You're making a list and checking it twice. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Free gifts so, for everyone. You didn't get the book you want? Come around Christmas time, maybe on December 25th. I might release it that day. So they uh, here. <laughs> That's your here's title. Your li- yeah, here's your list of books, of free books. <laughs> well, speaking of books, I suppose I should mention that at the beginning of this year, I was busily writing a book. And at the end of this year, it is out. So that's very exciting. I think that is part of the reason that new people are listening to the podcast. So if you are here because of my new book, welcome. Happy to have you here. <laughs> you can you can listen to it as much as you want, all this medieval history and my enthusiasm. I don't get to laugh as much in the book because <laughs> it's paper. Actually, I've just finished recording an audiobook. I should mention the book is How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. And uh, I just finished recording the audiobook and hopefully it will be out soon. I will let everybody know the second that it's out. But I realized I did this whole long audiobook without laughing because oh, you're, no. you're not allowed to laugh in a medieval well in an audiobook and so so people are not going to recognize my voice because i'm not laughing all the time so when the audiobook comes out i hope people get it and enjoy it but it is going to be a different experience for them i sound totally serious it's been wonderful to see your publishing career kind of just take off every kind of book jumps ahead. I remember you started with your self-publishing collection of five minute Neve list articles, mm-hmm. uh, which is a wonderful and people should get that too. Yes. <laughs> and, and I think maybe a, a year ago, we were probably talking about like life in medieval Europe. Yeah. And like, I think that was an excellent book, but you know, this one's so different and so unique. I'm really glad it's getting so much love and attention on social media. Yeah, thank you to everyone who has been loving it on social media. That's so nice. When you work so hard on something, then it goes out and you have absolutely no control over whether people are going to like it or not. It's so nice to see people that are enjoying it or they're enthusiastic about just receiving it in the mail. People are still receiving it in the mail day by day and sharing pictures with me on social media. And that's just been fantastic. But I should probably mention now that we're looking at the whole year in review, Thanks, I think, to the podcast, Life in Medieval Europe was a Kindle number one bestseller in medieval European history this this summer. So thanks, everybody. That book came out in 2019, and it's received some love this year. So thanks. Thanks, everybody, for reading it. I really enjoyed writing that book, too. I think people are just going to be switching you up. What's the latest Daniel Sabowski? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to give us a hint on what's coming up? Like, what are you thinking about writing? Um, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. But oh, I can right. tell you All right. that it looks like I should have another book coming down the pipeline soon, soon. But Ooh. I can't tell you anything else. But yeah, I'm going to be writing more books and they're still going to be fun. They're still going to be light medieval history as a way to, to get people interested in the Middle Ages in a way that I think is hopefully friendly, but still gives you the knowledge that you want and and sucks you into the black hole of medieval studies where you never want to escape. (laughs) (laughs) Does that sound too evil? No, it's, uh, yeah, I can't tell you what's what's coming up because we haven't signed anything in blood yet, but there there should be more books coming at you in the future. Yeah. Looking at 2022 for Medievalist.net, there are plans underway for our, actually us to kind of publish books. And we're going to just start with this set of coroner's rolls from the 14th century London. Something that's been bugging at me for about 20 years that this has not been published. So I'm getting all that little pieces in place for that. That was one of the things with with Medievalist.net I want to do in 2022 is have a bit of things that we can offer our readers, our audience, and like say, hey, this exists. So check it out. We've got that in the works. And I know I said this last year, probably, but, you know, I want to have more video content. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, people who don't know you may not realize that you are all ambition, head to toe. All ambition and We chatted with this, me and you, talking about focusing, right? I don't know. Are you my life coach? (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know. Are you successful? In that case, I'm your life coach. <laughs> You're spreading your your monkish wisdom. <laughs> so. Yeah, I suppose, you know, if you are living like a monk, you need to have some focus. And that is something yeah. I did say to you. Yes. But yeah. now that now that you've told everybody that you're going to publish these Coroner's Rolls, now you have to do it. Yeah. And if people are interested in what kind of stuff you can learn from these Coroner's Rolls, just to get them all excited about it, Peter, we did a podcast about that. Oh, yeah, week. we did. Yeah, that's right. I love I love talking about murder. <laughs> as long as you're still talking about it, just talking about it. Well, it has been an eventful year for us. And yeah, I'm just so excited to have been able to have another year of the podcast and to uh, be able to share medieval history with everybody because it is an absolute joy. What about you, Peter? I want to thank you for doing this podcast, closing in 150 episodes. Oh. It's been awesome to listen and, and learn from you and be a part of this and our audience on Medievalist.net and the Medieval Podcast and all the other podcasts. Just want to thank you for all your support. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for being part of our 2021, the best part of our 2021. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in 2022. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for the support you've given my little project all year long. Thanks for reading Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, being part of our book club, and enjoying each of our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. If being part of our community is one of your New Year's resolutions, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. It's last call for the special discount offered by my publisher, Abbeville Press, for How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, which you can still get for 20% off if you order it directly from their website until the end of 2021. Just go to abbeville.com, look up How to Live Like a Monk, and use the code BENEDICT, as in St. Benedict, to get 20% off the cover price as a special gift from me to you. We'll also have the link in the show notes. Thank you for all the love you've all shown the new book, my older books, and this podcast over the past year. This is my third full year of this journey, and it has been amazing. Thanks for being such a joyful, positive part of my life, as I hope I've been in yours. For all the best of the medieval world from 2021 and beyond, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite online bookstores, where you can even get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, which is out now worldwide. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a peaceful and happy new year. Yeah.